we always knew that Sam Darnold was talented. I don't think that was ever in doubt. I don't know if anyone – listen, we hadn't seen him play at this level this long. Right. He is not a system guy. Yes, is Kevin O'Connell's system very good, very quarterback friendly? But that conversation now has to be put to rest. right off of the punter's foot and then you got hunter long the scoop and score hello coach mcveigh you need that today you know i had a feeling listening to tom brady and kevin burkhart call that blocked punt to put the rams up 17-7 on the buffalo bills had a feeling we were in for a more interesting afternoon than i initially thought not sure i saw it getting that interesting of course Week 14 delivers one of the games of the season when we were least expecting it. Hi there. Welcome to the NFL on Fox podcast presented by Verizon, the NFL powered by Verizon 5G. I'm Dave Hellman. And as usual, so much to get to coming out of another incredible NFL Sunday. Of course, we got that banger of a game to get to. The Rams and Bills go absolutely wild at SoFi Stadium in a 44-42 to 42 classic. We'll get to that in a minute, but so many other storylines to follow. Kansas City Chiefs capitalized on that misstep by the Bills. Philadelphia Eagles hung on for dear life as Bryce Young's renaissance continues. Had Sam Darnold going off looking like an MVP candidate himself, one of the most explosive days from the Minnesota Vikings offense all season. And plus, surprising storyline, but a true one, true one nonetheless. Top of the NFL draft is coming into clearer focus even faster than I thought possible after some of the results we saw on Sunday. A lot to get into, but where else would we start but a game? That had 86 combined points. The L.A. Rams take down the Buffalo Bills. That is where we start our Sunday six. The biggest six storylines we think you need to know coming out of the weekend. And yeah, not a not a game for defense. If you're if you're big on fundamentals and good tackling and and punts and play in the field position game, Bills Rams might not have been for you. But man. If you like video game football, you know, going back to the Rams Chiefs game from what was it? 2018 touchdown, touchdown after touchdown after touchdown. Yeah, we had that in spades out here at SoFi Stadium. The Rams three and a half point underdogs in their own building score 44 points on the Bills. Definitely one of those games that produces just the weirdest stats you've ever heard. First game in NFL history in which both teams scored more than 40 points in a game with no turnovers. Yes, as you heard, the Rams did block a punt and return it for a touchdown. It's not officially categorized as a takeaway as it does happen on fourth down. It's also the first game in NFL history that produced more than 850 total yards with zero turnovers and zero sacks by either team. Both quarterbacks just trading haymaker after haymaker We'll get to the Josh Allen of it all in a minute because we're certainly not going to leave out that performance. But a borderline flawless day from Matthew Stafford, Sean McVay, calling this L.A. Rams offense. A picture-perfect example of why Matthew Stafford is your favorite quarterback's favorite quarterback and why I honestly think he's a top, top five, top six quarterback in this league, even if his stats don't always reflect it. Unconscious. About, against what had been a really salty Bills defense. 23 of 30, 320, two touchdowns, just one punt on the entire afternoon. And and all those stats are very conventional and and it looks good on a on a lower third here on the on the show. The stat that stands out to me, the Rams convert 11 of 15 on third down. It it felt demoralizing you could feel it through the tv screen by the end of this game how little hope the bills had of stopping this rams offense and and perhaps the call of the game in my opinion 
talked about it on the broadcast. When they weren't going 11 of 15 on third down, they went one of one on the biggest fourth down of the game, fourth and five from the Bills 35, got a chance to kick a long field goal and potentially go up six against a Bills offense that's been equally good. No, Sean McVay elects to go for it. Of course, Stafford picks it up with a throw to Tutu Atwell. They get 11 yards. They go on to take a 44-35 lead. Goes back to what we talked about last week. Similar sort of situation to what the Arizona Cardinals opted not to do against the Minnesota Vikings. The Rams say, why would we not put this game in the hands of our offense? We are going to get this damn first down, and they do. 11 of 15 on third down, one of one on fourth down. Absolutely incredible. And it's insane to think Cooper Cup catches five for 92 and a touchdown in this game. Kyron Williams, 97 total yards of offense and two touchdowns, and they pale in comparison to the game that Puka Nakua put on his signature moment of the season. Guys dealt with injuries this year. He's He's been good this year, but not as many weeks where he's making circus catch after circus catch like we saw last year when he was one of the breakout stars of the season. This, this was that Puka showing up one more time. Felt obvious from the very beginning the Rams had made him a huge part of their game plan touched the ball four times for 43 yards on their opening touchdown drive, and it just snowballed from there. 17 touches, 178 total yards, two touchdowns, 12 catches for 162, touched the ball as a runner way more often than you see for most star running backs. It's absolutely incredible day. It felt like every other time Puka touched the ball, it was a sports center top 10 type of highlight. Tom Brady had so many options in this game, more than than you could ever expect to have in one football game, but it makes perfect sense that Puka Nakua was his choice for LFG player of the game. My LFG player of the game, sorry Puka for my voice. There were so many touchdowns up here. I was screaming the whole time, so I lost my voice a little bit, but what a, I mean, there were so many great plays by you today. Talk to me about the one that sealed it. That blitz zero beater, that little slip screen to you on the outside. What did you see on that play? Did you feel those guys get out there and block for you? Describe that play for me. Man, it was sweet. Matthew's coming in the huddle while we're uh, fresh out of that timeout. He says, man, if, if we get a zero blitz right here, we're going to get ready to go to the our, our screen play and be like, man, I trust Cooper Cup and Matthew Stafford so much and Coop being able to get out to that corner. We had a press up corner, so we had uh, we we're looking for one-on-ones of being able to get a screen off. And then big Rob Havenstein, uh, I just think of all the veterans, and that made a, made an p- impact on that play. And being able to run off in the end zone felt fantastic. I know. I mean, what a shootout. It's going back and forth. They're, they're offense making huge plays. You guys are making huge plays. When you went in at halftime, obviously you felt good about where you're at, but I'm sure you thought you had to play a 60-minute game. What was it like with coming out with those some of those adjustments in the second half? 100%. Feeling like, man, we were hitting on all cylinders in the first half, but it, it requires all four quarters. Coming in, uh, coming out of halftime, Coach McVay and Matthew just preaching that, man, we just got to keep straining. We know what the, what they had in the other number 17 on the other side of the ball and the possibility of him to make plays. So we're counting on our defense, but, man, whenever t- when every time that offense steps out of the field, we need six points for sure. Yeah, and that we were a little worried up here when you got stepped on and in in on that run play. How's that calf feeling? Is it pretty banged up or get a little treatment? You'll be fine. How's it feeling right now? Uh, shoot, we want, so I feel fantastic. We'll get some treatment out. We'll see what uh, Reg and the crew has, has for me tomorrow. <laughs> awesome. And then tell me one last thing. What's Puka really mean? Because I know that's not your first. What does Puka mean in Samoan? Um, in Samoa, my grandma, my grandma Tom Lee had given me that name. That means uh, fat, chubby. <laughs> so that's why I think some of those run plays, coach is like, man, I trust him with the ball. <laughs> oh, so you got some pukas up front. You're not puka anymore. You got some big puka O linemen, is what I'm thinking. 100%. All the dogs in the front. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. I love seeing you play in person. You're off to such a great start, man. Keep it going. Congratulations. Thank you so much. You guys have a good one. Every game that I broadcast, I award the LFG player of the game to that one player who makes me say, let's go. It's funny, this game reminded me of another Rams classic from last year when they lost 37 to 31 in overtime to the Baltimore Ravens, another back and forth classic. Turns out it actually happened this week last season. That loss to Baltimore dropped the Rams to six and seven on the season, gave them a lot of work to do going into the final few weeks to make the playoffs, which they did. This one 
improves them to seven and six. Still got some work to do, but all of a sudden looking much more alive than we thought in the NFC West. I love when just nice little moments of kismet when things come together like that. Incredible, incredible effort from their offense. But not not to forget about the losers in a game like this. Not often that I'll say that you improve your MVP chances in a win. I don't know how you watch Josh Allen on Sunday and felt like he'd lost ground in that conversation despite the loss. 424 total yards from Josh. Six touchdowns accounted for. 82 rushing yards. That's his highest total in three years. Career best three rushing touchdowns. Just guy was an automatic bucket all day. I don't know what was more impressive. His ability to gain yards on the ground, had a 30-yard carry in this game, or the lasers that he was firing all over the field. In particular, his two throws to Khalil Shakir had the laser on the inbreaker over the middle of the field that hit Shakir perfectly in stride, let him knife right through the Rams' defense on a 51-yard touchdown, or the freaking hole shot that he had later in the game that put the Bills right on the one-yard line where he finished it off. Of course he did with a quarterback sneak. It is brutal to get that game from Josh Allen on the road and not come away with a victory. Huge missed opportunity for the Buffalo Bills. We will emphasize just how big of a missed opportunity in a minute. You're, you're constantly chasing the Kansas City Chiefs. You're trying to gain ground on them. You've got the, head, the tiebreaker in the head-to-head. You lose this game, and now a road trip to Detroit where suddenly the number one overall seed in the AFC felt like it was coming into focus for you, could be slipping if the Bills can't find a way to beat arguably the best team in football next week at Ford Field. But not to, not to rush past this game because – you don't get many of these ever. You might get one a season. 86 total points, most scored in an NFL game this season. Both teams going over 440 yards of offense. Just, like I said, I know for the purists, you would maybe like to see a little bit more defense. You'd like to see somebody offer up a little bit more resistance. What? Three combined, four combined punts in this entire game. And the last one was a game ceiling play. Rams punted away with six seconds to play. Not much hope for a Bills comeback at that point. Maybe you'd like to see a little bit more in the way of defense, but it is so much fun to see any quarterback on a heater like this, let alone two doing it in the same game. How could you not be entertained? by what Matthew Stafford and Josh Allen did at SoFi Stadium on Sunday. It always feels like the place you least expect it, but the Rams, with one of the most entertaining wins, a huge win to keep their hopes of winning the NFC West alive, while the Bills have to find a way to rebound. Going to be an interesting week for Buffalo. Maybe some some coaching decisions Sean McDermott could have done differently. The, the choice to run a quarterback sneak on the goal line, needing all of your timeouts there at the end. I think that's going to be discussed a lot in the greater Buffalo area this week. Like I said, trip to Detroit coming up quickly, not a game you can afford to lose if you have any hope of getting that AFC bye week. We'll see how they handle it. But in the meantime, just going to bask in the warmth of these incredible Josh Allen and Matthew Stafford highlights for at least the next 24 hours. The second item on our Sunday six is our victory unlocked. It's brought to you by Zillow agents, tours, loans, homes. And it, it highlights just how important that earlier bills result was because couldn't you feel it coming? I promise this isn't a copy and paste from a previous week. This is a completely unique result that took place on Sunday night. The Kansas City Chiefs were involved in a close defensive struggle, stressful game that came down to the end, struggled to separate themselves despite having an early lead. And yet, in the final few minutes, they made just enough plays. They executed just well enough. They got the exact right amount of yards to put themselves in position to win the game on special teams at the buzzer. You know how this goes. Chiefs do it again. Another insanely stressful win. Another division title. Chiefs take down the LA Chargers 19-17 to win the AFC West for a ninth straight year. Back-to-back 19-17 wins against division rivals 
that they were favored to beat. They needed something to go their way in the final moments. You, you could, you could, there are five different things that went their way here against the LA Chargers in a game that, for the briefest of moments, I thought the Chargers really might be able to steal. They took the lead with four and a half minutes to play. They had all their timeouts. You figure, okay, even if the Chiefs go up and score here, the Chargers should have a chance with the ball to maybe try to steal this thing at Arrowhead, keep the division race alive for another week. But no, 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 because Patrick Mahomes is still that guy that you want at the end of a football game. They get the ball four and a half minutes to play. They convert two huge third downs. Patrick Mahomes does his Patrick Mahomes thing where he scrambles for 10 yards when he needed eight to pick up a huge first down with three and a half to play. And you know, Jim Harbaugh is using his timeouts as judiciously as he possibly can. He's trying to keep this thing alive. Third and seven, timeouts all used up. If the Chiefs get it, they can do whatever they want. They can drain the clock. If they don't, they got a kick and the Chargers get a shot. I don't need to even say anything. Patrick Mahomes, he he makes the game deciding play with his feet. He scrambles just enough to get the Chargers to commit. He finds Travis Kelsey. Yes, Travis Kelsey who's had a mostly forgettable year, but you know he's going to be there to catch a nine-yard pass on third and seven with the game on the line. And if all that wasn't enough, of course Matthew Wright, who's replacing Harrison Butker, who's injured, is going to doink the field goal. And for 31 other teams, whereas the doink would hit the end zone turf and send this game into a Chargers upset, Matthew Wright's doink banks between the uprights. The Chiefs win the division as time runs out. I think this team was built in a lab to make people mad. Their last six wins have come by one score. 10 of their 12 wins this season have been decided by seven points or less. They have the best record in the NFL. They have the 11th best point differential in the NFL, plus 56 point differential for a team that cannot lose is absolutely mind-boggling. It's it's basically never been easy. Even, even their wins against the Saints and 49ers, which were technically by more than one possession, not technically, they were, but if you watch those games, you know that there was a lot more bullshit going on in those games than the scoreline would suggest. It's just, this is who they are. But you know what? You're crazy not to trust it. You are crazy not to trust it when Patrick Mahomes can do this week in and week out. And it is such a huge week for the Chiefs because they find a way to win this game. They lock up the division. But more importantly, they get a win on the weekend that the Bills finally lose. Remember, you don't need me to remind you, Buffalo beat Kansas City a few weeks ago. They've got the head-to-head tiebreaker. Buffalo was breathing down their necks. And now... Not time to relax, but at least now you can exhale a little bit. There is some margin for error. Chiefs have a two-game lead on Buffalo with just four games to play this season. It's it's not decided yet. Absolutely not. The Chiefs haven't won a stress-free game in two months. How could we possibly say that there's not going to be any more drama in the AFC in the AFC playoff race? But it's it's got to be nice to know you have that little bit of breathing room so you can afford a slip against say the Houston Texans or the Pittsburgh Steelers both of whom are coming up on the schedule. I wouldn't recommend it, but at least you can allow yourself that margin for error. Big weekend. I I don't think anybody was expecting this to be the week that the Chiefs gained some ground in the playoff race. I think, you know, both of these teams were playing the LA teams felt very much like a, a fate accompli that the Bills were going to beat the Rams. And if anything, maybe it was the Chiefs that would lose this game to the Chargers. But no, no, no. It's this weekend that the Chiefs gained some ground. I would say, not to rain on their parade, and, and I refuse to doubt the Kansas City Chiefs, but I would just like to point out this offensive tackle issue for Kansas City is not going away. It was longtime veteran DJ Humphreys that got the start at left tackle against the Chargers. Struggled early, which is totally understandable. Hasn't played a lot of football this year, but he gets banged up in the game. So now you're going back to Wanya Morris. Patrick Mahomes got hit 13 times in this game. He was sacked another three. 
at this point, I, I don't even want to entertain the idea that the Chiefs can be beaten because so few teams seem capable of doing it. But eventually, when the playoffs do start, that is that's something I'm watching out for down the line. If if maybe, if maybe somebody can make more plays than the Chiefs at some point, but it was not in week 14. While those AFC contenders were dealing with chaos, it felt like business as usual over in the NFC. Third item on our Sunday six, the NFC contenders continuing to keep pace. Thought the most emphatic of those wins, we'll get to some of the closer ones later on, one of the most emphatic wins of the weekend, the Minnesota Vikings pulling away from the Atlanta Falcons in a 42-21 win. A couple things come to mind here. It's easy to dismiss a win against Atlanta as a team in freefall. This was the Falcons' fourth straight loss, but as we've talked about, this is a Minnesota team that has managed to make every game dramatic here over the last five, six weeks, and it was headed in that direction again on Sunday, tie game at the end of the third quarter, and then the Vikings just put the pedal to the metal, and pulled away in a game that t- it turned into a blowout in a matter of a couple positions, uh, possessions. Turnovers will have that effect. That's number one, is that the Vikings managed to get a stress-free win for the first time in a while. And number two, what are these guys capable of if Sammy D, Sam Darnold, can play like that? Holy cow. Career-high 347 passing yards, career-high five touchdowns. Jordan Addison and Justin Jefferson sliced and diced the Atlanta Falcons defense. Darnold just a couple of fractions, a couple decimal points away, tenth of a point away from a perfect passer rating and what's got to be the best game of his NFL career, the, the crown jewel of this renaissance season in Minnesota. Phenomenal day from him and the Vikings offense. Those were the two things that I wanted to chat about with Greg Olson and Joe Davis when I caught up with them after the game. Well, guys, I don't know if it's breaking news that Justin Jefferson and Jordan Addison are great players, but how much higher is the Vikings ceiling when these guys can produce at this level? Yeah, I mean, you combine that with everything else that they do well. This is a scary team. Yeah, I mean, I think I think we all knew they were really good, but I think we always knew that Sam Darnold was talented. I don't think that was ever in doubt. I don't know if anyone well, – listen, we hadn't seen him play at this level this long. Right. He is not a system guy. Yes, is Kevin O'Connell's system very good, very quarterback friendly? But that conversation now has to be put to rest. He is playing the quarterback position as well, system aside – really as well as anybody in the league over the last couple weeks. And I think Sam Darnold, yes, he has good weapons, and these guys are incredible. Sam Darnold needs to continue to get the you know the, the recognition, and he, he deserves all of it. Felt like we were heading for another entertaining fourth quarter, and then the Falcons, not to take credit away from the Vikings, but it just felt like the Falcons melted down. I mean, turnovers, penalties, felt like a microcosm of their season. How... Do you try to correct these sorts of problems when they all sort of raise their heads up at the same time like that? Yeah, it was the McLeod fumble on the kick return downhill from there. That was it. It just it felt like after that fumble, they had given up the touchdown, fell down by seven. Okay, Cousins came out. They were hot. They had scored their last possession. And then fumble, you're down right. 14. And then you get into a must pass. It turns into a drop back fest. And uh He had a chance there with Pitts against the cover zero if he kind of puts that ball a little more inside. But all things aside, this Vikings team, offense, defense, their ability to take the ball away, their ability the last couple weeks to protect the ball. Scary, man. It's really, it's as good a group as as you see consistently the last couple weeks throughout the whole league. Every week, I'm so impressed by the way the Vikings managed to stay right on Detroit's heels. Doesn't look like they're going away anytime soon, guys. Really fun performance from them. I appreciate it. All right, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Like I said to Joe and Greg, I really am so impressed with the way this Vikings team keeps answering the bell. At the clip the Lions are winning, it'd be understandable if the Vikings fell off the pace, but they simply refuse. Look around the standings after this win against Atlanta, Minnesota. Six straight wins after Buffalo's loss to the L.A. Rams on Sunday. They have the third best winning streak in the league, only behind the Detroit Lions and the Philadelphia Eagles. They are keeping pace with the league's elite. It's going to be a bummer for them if this type of season is only good enough to get them a number five seed, the first wild card seed, because that's how good Detroit is. But they're putting themselves in position, at least, to have something to say about that. They got to. They got to keep it up for a few more weeks, but they still do get that return game against the Lions. 
on the road at the end of the year. Lions still have a tough game or two coming up. They play the Bills next week. They still have a game against the 49ers. Maybe you get a little bit of help. It's not out of the realm of possibility that the Vikings can still win the division and and get a top seed. It feels unlikely. That's what the math says. That's what the probabilities say. But they're putting themselves in position to be in that conversation, which is impressive when you're keeping pace with a team that hasn't lost since week two. That's all I'm saying. Every week, I expect the Vikings to allow a little bit of distance to creep in between them and the Lions, and it just doesn't happen. Now, on the flip side of that, typically, by the time we do a Monday recap show, Thursday night football is a distant memory, but this is a week where it feels worth highlighting because it is such a small margin of error between being the one seed in the NFC and potentially a wild card. The Lions made sure they found those margins against the Green Bay Packers. Talk about a Thursday night game that lived up to its potential. They win a thriller at 34-31. People are going to be talking about Dan Campbell's decision to go for it on fourth and a foot in a tie game late. I personally loved it. I can't say I loved every aggressive decision Dan Campbell made in that game. Going for it on fourth down on your own 30-yard line in a close game is it's a little much even for me, but four of five on fourth down on the night, and that last one puts you in position to run the clock down to two seconds before you kick a 35-yard field goal. I love winning the game with the unit that brought you there. The Lions calling card is offense, and specifically their incredible offensive line. This defense was they, they, they were a mass unit by the end of this game. They were already injured. They lost several players to injury during the course of the game. Why are you going to ask a banged up defense to keep a win alive against Jordan Love when you can just pick up a foot and not ask them to do anything? Absolutely love it. It harkens back to the conversations we had last week with Greg Olson about calculated, aggressive decision making. Dan Campbell's the king of it. Even if it doesn't always go his way, or even if he gets a little crazy with it in his own territory, it evens out in the end, and it's it's stuff like that that is the difference between the Lions still commanding the the lead in the division, the number one seed in the NFC playoffs, or opening things back up to the Minnesota Vikings. I, I absolutely love it. Shout out to the Green Bay Packers for an inspired effort. It is absolutely brutal that you are nine and four and the last projection I saw gave you less than a 1% chance to win the NFC North. That is just how good this division has been this season. I did mention that the Eagles handled business and won their game to keep pace in the NFC, but the fourth item on our Sunday six, let's break it down because it was nowhere near as stress-free as the Minnesota Vikings' fourth quarter against Atlanta. They held on for dear life. Philly becomes the latest contender to struggle with these new-look Carolina Panthers. So much fun to watch. Three, four weeks in a row now. The Eagles do get the win, 22-16. They punch a playoff ticket, but ooh, even the score does not do justice to how scary this was because it looked like the Panthers had them dead to rights. Bryce Young, with less than a minute to play, finds Xavier Leggett down the seam in the, not quite in the end zone, but he managed to roll into it. It looked like he was going to score a go-ahead touchdown with 50 seconds to play, and and all your thoughts start to creep in about, oh, this, this was the territory the Eagles were in last year. Can they keep it together if they're frustrated? Is it all going to implode when they lose a game in frustrating fashion? And then the replay showed that Leggett could not quite hang on to the ball. No catch, no touchdown, no win for the Carolina Panthers. They come up short one more time. It's the latest close call for them. Eagles slip away with that ninth straight win. Saquon Barkley, maybe the least frustrated guy in the Eagles locker room, he sets the Eagles' single-season rushing record, beats out uh, LaShawn McCoy, friend of the show, LaShawn McCoy's old record of 1607. He's passed up Shady still with a month to play in their season. Had a chance to talk to Adam Amin and Mark Sanchez, who were on the call, not just about Saquon, but about how this Carolina Panthers team is going to find ways to get over the finish line. Surprisingly fun afternoon in Philadelphia. Well, guys, you talk about young, inexperienced teams needing to learn how to win. I don't know if you could draw up a better example than that brutal sequence by the Panthers there in that that final possession. 
Yeah, tough for Bryce Young and Dave Canales in particular to swallow, especially considering the success they had on the offensive end on their late drives against Kansas City and Tampa Bay, looking for that signature win. It's one of the things that the guys talked to us the other day about is we're starting to get a better sense of how to do it, but haven't seen it in a signature moment to try to win a game just yet. And they're really coming down to these critical moments and making crucial errors, whether it's the delay of game, uh, some drop passes, I mean, when Bryce Young dissects a defense like that, gets C.J. Gardner-Johnson to bite on an underneath route and rips that post, you got to find a way to come down with that, even if you're a rookie in Leggett. I mean, that's a game winner right there. And until they start making those plays, they're going to be on the losing side of these games. Does it speak to the season that Saquon Barkley's having that this felt like a quiet game for him, and then I look up at the end of this thing, and he's got 124, and he sets the franchise record? Yeah, how about it, right? I mean, but this is how they've done it methodically over the course of the season. They grind you out. Mark said it very aptly. I thought you said, what, the second and third quarter runs are like body blows, and then typically in the fourth quarter they become knockout punches. Exactly right, and he sneaks up on teams. His yards start to accumulate, and just as you mentioned, Dave, as soon as you look at the scoreboard and the stat sheet at the end of the game, it's, wow, this guy went for over 100 again. And I think a lot of that was due to the first half. I mean, Jalen Hurts was a little off in the passing game. It didn't look precise. He was a little hesitant to cut the ball loose a couple times when I think he had some open receivers. And so when that's happening, Kellen Moore knows, hey, let's lean on the run game. Let's let Saquon Barkley take us to victory. We were a little surprised, Dave, I think maybe late in the game that Barkley wasn't getting as many carries because we saw it against Baltimore last week. We've yeah. seen a handful of times this year, right? He gets the closing touchdown. He had one in the fourth quarter last week. They kind of got away from the run game on some risky play calls and some risky plays, but they're able to get away with it because of how effective their defense was making the big play late. A little more stressful than what we've been used to from the yeah. Eagles over the last six weeks, but hey, we're not complaining about that. Entertainment continues to follow y'all wherever you go. Adam and Mark, <laughs> I, I appreciate it, guys. Take care. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, appreciate buddy. you. No matter how dramatic the finish, a win is a win. The Eagles improve to 11-2, and two, and they didn't clinch a playoff spot with the win, but they get a couple favorable results. Atlanta loses to Minnesota. Arizona loses to Seattle. We'll talk about that in a minute. But with those two losses, they do become the latest team to clinch a playoff spot. They're the second NFC team to assure itself a place in the postseason. They have not locked up the NFC East, but they do make sure they are in the playoff field 11 and 2. If you're if you're watching, you can see the playoff picture here. So we've got Philly right on Detroit with the in the number 2 spot. Seahawks with a big win. Not quite locking up the NFC West, especially with that big Rams upset, but in a nice spot. And, of course, we mentioned the Falcons in free, free fall. They have officially given up the NFC South to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I mentioned last week on the show, pretty manageable road for the Buccaneers the rest of the way. So no pressure, guys, but your destiny is in your hands. And we talked about this last week. Washington taking the week off, even with a loss, Green Bay sitting pretty. It is going to be very, very tough for somebody to break into that wild card field from outside the current three spots. But I don't know, based on the way the Rams were playing against Buffalo, I'm not ready to write them off just yet. That is what the field looks like, but let's get back to Philadelphia. I don't want to make too much of this. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be dramatic about it. I've been pounding the drum for the Eagles for a minute at this point. They're far too impressive when they get rolling, but man, the vibes coming out of this game were a little too familiar to last season though it's the first game in a while where it felt like last year where the Eagles win a game and you're left kind of saying yeah but eh, do we do we really feel good about this and and it's not just me saying that that was the talk coming out of the Eagles locker room Jordan Mailata their phenomenal left tackle very critical of the way they played in this game passing game really struggled to get going Saquon was was really the only thing working fantastically for this offense, him and, and Jalen Hurts' running ability, because passing game, just 108 yards. Devontae Smith and A.J. Brown struggled to really get involved. A.J. Brown slammed his helmet after a three and out at one point. He said afterward that it's incredibly tough to get into a rhythm with how little the Eagles were passing in this game. He said they all, or Devontae Smith said they all need to get on the same page a little bit better. It's not it's not quite what I want to hear from a team with Super Bowl aspirations in December. Having said that, I'm going to give them grace. This is the first time in six weeks that it's it's really been overly stressful for the Eagles. you got to go back to that Jacksonville game 
to find a, a situation where it was this much in doubt at the end of the game. So I'm just, I'm putting a pin in it. My eyebrow is raised. It's not full fledged concern just yet, but not, not the mood you want in a post game locker room of an 11 and two team, in my opinion, but let's make sure we give our flowers where they're deserved. Saquon Barkley. We already said it. He passed up Shady's franchise rushing record. He is still well on pace to set the NFL rushing record that belongs to Eric Dickerson would be absolutely incredible. We wrote off the running game. We wrote off running backs years ago, and a guy might reset a record that has stood for that long. He caught up with our Christina Pink after another phenomenal outing. Saquon, the ninth consecutive win coming in dramatic fashion, but you guys able to pull it off and a nice stop from your defense. What are you learning about this group as the season rolls on? I mean, we're a tough bunch. Uh, we're resilient. We always trust in each other. Uh, no matter what the situation in the game, we, we, we believe we're going to win. Uh, we knew it was going to be a tough team. Um, obviously, their record doesn't show how good they are. They've been a lot of close games, just having to figure out ways to finish it. And we knew it was going to be a 60-minute fight, and we got the job done. Most rushing yards in a single season for the Eagles. You've been re-energized here in Philly. How much does that mean to you? Uh, I'll be lying to you if I said that wasn't pretty cool, um, and especially because, you know, Shady held the record. And growing up in Pennsylvania, I uh, wasn't really Eagles fan, I was a Jets fan, but being a fan of Shady and seeing the things he was able to do and you know, have my name mentioned with that guy means a lot, but you know, couldn't do it without my teammates and my linemen. Uh, they've been tremendous for me this year. All right, thanks so much, Saquon. Thank you, take care. Fifth item on our Sunday Six is the NFC West showdown that felt like the most important matchup of the weekend pertaining to playoff odds, probabilities, all that good stuff, and we know the outcome. Not quite as dramatic as I was hoping for, honestly. The Seattle Seahawks... Maybe dominate is too strong of a word, but a thoroughly convincing road win in Arizona. They beat the Cardinals 30 to 18. And I got to say, it's been fun to watch the Seahawks come together every week. Like, you know, like adding a different infinity stone to their Thanos gauntlet every single week. Cause that's what looks like it's happening. Like way back at the beginning of the season, it was basically Geno Smith is the only thing we got going for us. Then it became Geno Smith. And this defense is getting a little bit better. Now you got Geno Smith and a lockdown defense. And on Sunday, the Seahawks running game comes to life in a way we haven't been used to seeing. Zach Charbonnet goes for a career high 134 rushing yards. He's the first Seahawks runner with a 100 yard game since all the way back in week one. Seahawks rush for 176 yards as a team. You guessed it. That's easily their best total of the year. It all feels like it's coming together. This is such a well-rounded team. We talked about the run defense improvement. Ernest Jones showing up to help out with things. He gets a huge pick in this game. What a phenomenal trade from the Seattle Seahawks to get the former L.A. Ram by way of Tennessee. I, I wonder how Sean McVay feels about the fact that Ernest Jones is in his division now and the Seattle Seahawks are leading that division largely thanks to him helping their run defense improve. Just a phenomenal little storyline for a guy who got traded out of the division at the beginning of the season. Anyway, Seattle Seahawks looking like a very dangerous team. This felt like it could be an Arizona game early on. Kyler Murray hit Michael Wilson for a long touchdown to start things out. And it was, it was all Seattle and Arizona had plenty of opportunities to complete some kind of comeback, but two big interceptions from the Seattle defense in the first half really put their stamp on things. It was 24 to 10 at halftime. Arizona scored early in the third quarter, but was never really able to build on that. Mike McDonald defensive transformation here over the last four or five, six weeks has been truly remarkable. And we, we mentioned it at the beginning of the week in the preview episode, the Seattle Seahawks, had all this stuff on the line with a win, a 76% chance to make the playoffs at eight and five. You're not going to get everything you ask for for Christmas. You know, if the Seahawks had gotten this win while the Rams lost to Buffalo, maybe it's a better weekend for them. Of course, the Rams get one of the most surprising results of the week. So they're still hanging around in the background, but all things considered, eight and five. You control your destiny in the division. You basically vanquish the Cardinals. It's a it, brutal, brutal situation for Arizona. I feel for them at six and seven. You look at the standings here. It should tell you that they're still alive, but the nerds say 
that their chance of reaching the postseason now at just a measly 12%, it would take some sort of meltdown to let them back into the conversation. So the NFC West looks just as tight as it's been all year, but it really feels like we're starting to zero in on this thing. Seattle and L.A. control their destiny. Seattle, for obvious reasons. L.A., a game behind the Seahawks, but they did beat them in that overtime thriller in uh, earlier this season up in Seattle. So a Rams win over Seattle in a few weeks would give them the tiebreaker in the event that they have the same record. They play. Ooh, that is the, ooh, that's the season finale. Tell me that wouldn't be fun. Seahawks Rams here in LA with a chance to go to the postseason on the line. I'm getting ahead of myself, but that sort of feels like where we're headed. Seattle on top, the Rams, the next best te- thing technically have a chance to control their own destiny. But the script writers were really in their bag with this division because up next, you've got Thursday night football between the Rams coming off of an incredible win against Buffalo and their old pals, the San Francisco 49ers. Maybe, maybe it's too late for San Francisco. Just a 14% chance of making the playoffs, but San Francisco team we saw on Sunday in week 14 I'm not writing them off at all because they were just four-point favorites at home against Chicago. I expected a slugfest, a bit of a street fight. No, we got the best version possible of the San Francisco 49ers. They crushed the Chicago Bears 38-13, to and that was without Christian McCaffrey. That was without Jordan Mason. We know all the problems that have plagued San Francisco all season long. They still moved up and down the field, looking like the best version of themselves, 452 yards. Brock Purdy, an amazing day, passer rating of 145. Bears just offered little to no resistance, which not necessarily surprised by a San Francisco win, surprised by the lack of resistance from Chicago in Thomas Brown's first game as interim head coach. That's what I talked about with Kenny Albert and Jonathan Vilma, who were on the call. Well, guys, I got to say, that didn't look like a 49ers team that was down to its fourth and then its fifth running back. What What's the key to, to finding production despite the injuries at that position? No, it certainly did not, Dave. A 24-0 lead at the half. Almost a perfect first half for the 49ers offense. Yeah, the 49ers offense, they really came out. And I love the way that they were utilizing the passing game and the play action, expecting the run, or at least the Bears defense was expecting the run. Didn't happen, and then George Kittle got involved. So as soon as you kind of opened up this Bears defense, the running game became available. And Isaac Garendo did a nice job before he exited the game. So you look at a very balanced offense. A nice way of executing, especially to start the game by the 49ers. Uh, We know the 49ers offense is loaded with talent, but defense has been the Bears' saving grace for so much of this season. Was it surprising the ease with which San Francisco moved the ball and Mm -hmm. scored points in this game? Uh, it was surprising when they got in the red zone. wasn't surprising that they would get chunk yards. I expected that George Kittle would have a big game. Uh, but the red zone where the Bears had been historically good this season, that's where they really let up, gave up touchdowns every time. So you start giving touchdowns instead of field goals, you know, it just puts the game completely out of whack. So that first half, that's really what happened with the Bears. That red zone defense wasn't there. Credit to the 49ers offense. Kyle Shanahan did a great job of executing game plan planning against this defense and came away with touchdowns every time. Really impressive performance to end a losing streak in style. Guys, as always, I appreciate it. That's where we stand in the league's most unpredictable division right now. Got to feel good to be a Seattle Seahawk, but if there is a team that is not worth writing off, and again, I, I don't care about the probabilities. I'm just talking about the talent on the roster You probably don't want San Francisco on your schedule if you're trying to make the postseason. That's what's lying in wait for the L.A. Rams, a road trip to San Francisco to try to keep their chances of winning the NFC West alive. No no picnic for Seattle either, by the way. Green Bay is up next for them. So looking looking at percentages on a website will give you a very straightforward look at what is ahead for the NFC West. But... I'm going to step out on a limb and say there are a few more twists and turns waiting for us with this division, even if the Seahawks did put 
not just one, two very good feet forward with an impressive win against Arizona on Sunday afternoon. Final item on our Sunday six is not about juicy playoff scenarios. It's actually quite the opposite. I had a striking realization as I settled in for the early window on Sunday morning, morning here on the West Coast anyway. Half of the early games on Sunday were between teams with losing records. There were some real dogfights for draft positioning happening in week 14. Made me think about the fact that, look, it, it's been a league of haves and have-nots for most of this season, but it really feels like the draft picture is coming into clearer focus here over the last couple of weeks. Three more teams were mathematically eliminated from playoff contention in week 14. That brings the total to seven on the season. Jacksonville, New England, Las Vegas, and the New York Giants were already out heading into Sunday. Cleveland, Tennessee, and the New York Jets all joined them with this latest round of games. If that sounds high, it is. It's not, it's not crazy high. There were way more that were already mathematically eliminated by this point in the 2019 season, but it is the most in five years, the most mathematically eliminated teams after week 14 since the 2019 season. There were only two teams out of it at this point last year. There were just three teams eliminated at this point in 2022. So if you've been watching the NFL this season thinking, man, a lot of these teams stink, you're not wrong at all. Seven teams now out of the race. Let's just go down it. New York Jets mathematically eliminated in overtime against the Miami Dolphins, 32-26. Shout out to Rich Semini of ESPN for this stat. Sunday was the fifth time the Jets have lost a game they led at some point in the fourth quarter. That is the highest mark of such losses in their franchise history. Jets took the lead with just about a minute to play. They let the Dolphins drive into field goal range tie it on a long kick at the end of regulation game goes to overtime. John U. Smith does his thing, takes over after being quiet all day. Cause of course that's how it works out in overtime. I guess if, if you're a dolphins fan, Hey, cool. It keeps their slim playoff hopes alive, but mainly it just illustrates what a disaster this has been for Aaron Rodgers. Longest playoff drought in the NFL keeps going. It's at 14 years for the New York jets now. And that's the intrigue for me is Aaron Rodgers, obviously into his forties at this point under contract for another year. It's been a lackluster season for the jets. And now both the head coach and the general manager that brought him to New York are out with the jets. It'll be a whole new regime. Are they interested in Aaron Rodgers being their starting quarterback? Is anybody in the NFL interested in Aaron Rodgers being their starting quarterback? Would he will be willing to be a, a backup or compete for a job? My guess is going to be no. Very interesting to see where that all goes for a team that maybe it was misguided promise, but man, there was, there was still promise for the New York Jets as long ago as September feels at this point. If you were curious, by the way, six of the seven eliminated teams in the NFL right now all in the AFC. So yeah, not to knock the Dolphins. They do mathematically still have a path to the playoffs, but very, very few teams remaining alive for that last wild card spot. We said it last week. Basically feels like it's going to come down to Denver and maybe the Indianapolis Colts for that last wild card spot. Not a lot of drama, at least for playoff for wild card purposes in the AFC. We we know what that's going to look like. Brutal state of affairs in general for New York football, though. The Giants, they were already mathematically eliminated, but they lose to New Orleans on a potential game tire. Speaking of tying field goals at the end of the game, Brian Bercy of the New Orleans Saints blocks their game tying attempt at the end of their game against the Saints. They lose to New Orleans 14 to 11. I don't care. Don't care about that game. Don't care about this version of the New York Giants, and, and you shouldn't either at this point in the year, but I do find this interesting. Just file this away in your mental index here. Giants lose with 10 seconds to play on a field goal that could have sent the game to overtime. At roughly the same time this is happening, the Jacksonville Jaguars are beating Tennessee 10-6 to in another game which, sorry, don't really care about the actual game, but the outcome 
It's the Jags' first win in seven weeks. Gives them three on the season. And that result moves the Las Vegas Raiders into the number one overall pick slot. And the New York Giants now moving up over Jacksonville into the number two spot. So the Giants and the Raiders, by virtue of this Jaguars win over Tennessee, have pole positioning for the number one overall pick in the 2025 NFL draft. Is there a quarterback there worth taking? Could Shadur Sanders be the number one overall pick for one of these teams? I don't know. But moments like this are always fun for me where one year, two years, five years from now, you can look back to that blocked field goal and say, man, how many franchises' fortunes might have changed on that one play? I'm filing it away. I find it interesting, even if nobody else does. Mention the Cleveland Browns. Looked like they were going to give Pittsburgh a game for a quarter and a half. They fall 27-14 to 14 in a loss to Pittsburgh. We said it, the Steelers' streak of 30-whatever years it is without being swept by the Browns is intact. Browns mathematically eliminated. Again, an, another team, I think, in such a loaded AFC North, I don't know how many people genuinely expected them to to win that division or pull off the same caliber of success they did last year with Joe Flacco. But I do know that after winning 11 games with five different quarterbacks last year, I didn't think the Cleveland Browns would be mathematically out of the picture with a month still to play. Too much talent on that roster for them to be this bad. And on a similar line of Aaron Rodgers, it raises interesting questions about the future of the quarterback position in Cleveland. Can you really go back to the Deshaun Watson? Well, again, after the way this season was going, even when he was healthy, not sure what the answer to that situation is, but it is officially a problem for 2025 as the Browns are out of it. There are now six teams with a three and 10 record. And like I said, the Raiders and giants have pole positioning at 2 and 11. But man, not saying it's going to be entertaining football to watch, but the positioning for the best possible draft order is going to be intense with so many bad teams, so many teams that are already out of the playoff race and see just how close to rock bottom we can get as teams jockey try to have the best draft pick possible. So that is our 2025 draft order update. Try to keep that to a minimum because playoff race is shaping up to be plenty intriguing on its own. Even if even if the wild cards are settled earlier than what we're used to, so much drama with the positioning of the seating, where everybody's going to be ordered, how it's all going to shake out, and there's only four more weeks to figure all of that out. I cannot wait we will see how it progresses, but that does it for our Sunday six. That does it for our show, but never fear. As always, we will be back so quickly Tuesday. We'll be back to take a look at what I think is the most crowded coach of the year conversation in recent memory. So many good candidates, no idea how to separate who wins that award. So many fantastic coaching jobs around the league. Obviously the Cowboys and the Bengals facing off on Monday night football in a Simpsons game. Can't wait to see what that looks like. And of course, we will check in with Jay Glazer as we always do for the latest news injury updates coming out of the weekend. So much to look forward to for Tuesday. We'll be back then. As always, I appreciate it so much and I will talk to y'all next time.